hope you're heading for the bedroom. <laughs> I've got sand in my underpants. Hey everyone, Genome here, coming at you with the next episode of my Star Trek The Next Generation review series. The series where I take a look back at each and every one of the episodes of The Next Generation and to see if they still are worthy of the praise and general adoration from the fan base that they get. Uh, so far, Season 1's been a pretty mixed bag of bad to really bad, but uh, maybe there's some light on the horizon. Uh, I'm on currently episode 15. Mind you, I've seen all these episodes dozens of times before, but I've never done them in review format, so just a little warning there. But yeah, we are currently on episode number 15 of Season 1, and that is none other than Too Short a Season. Uh, this episode gets lambasted a lot for the makeup effects. But I will say there is an interesting story woven in here. And for once, the Federation is painted as not the, maybe the goody two-shoes type, uh, the perennial white hat, if it, as it were. Um, and there's some darker undertones here, sort of. But it's still kind of saccharine away. But let's go ahead and dig into it real briefly with a plot synopsis that I'll get to the pros and cons at the end. So we are let off right from the beginning with a, looks like a hostage situation, right? We are in orbit around Persephone 5, where I have been sent to confer with Admiral Mark Jameson in regard to an extraordinary situation. And the leader of the world is demanding that Admiral Jameson, uh, who is previously a hostage negotiator on this planet 45 years prior. Captain. There are certain details of this mission that you should understand before we begin. Yes, sir. Come to negoti negotiate for the hostage's release. So, Admiral Jameson is 85 years old. Uh, he also has something called uh, Iverson's disease. Something like that. Iverson's, Iverson's. Um, basically, he is wheelchair bound and uh, he's just an incredibly old man and weak and decrepit. Um, he gets around with the use of the multifunctional Star Trek. I guess hovering <laughs> wheelchair. It's been seen in various different forms throughout the series. So he is basically brought on board and he lets Captain McCard know right away that uh, yes, he is in charge of the mission itself, even though Card's still in charge of the ship. I am not simply an advisor. On any assignment I accompany, Starfleet has designated me senior mission officer. I control the away team and all its actions, is that understood? Uh, and basically, the rest of the story is them either getting to the planet and dealing with the leader Karnas. Karnas is the, is the is the world ruler. It's never really given what his title is, but whatever he is, he's the leader. Um, yeah, but basically, that's the entire story is him getting there and negotiating the release. But there's obviously more than meets the eye. This one, uh, the main actual thread outside of that is Jameson himself, and Jameson is interesting in the fact that. This episode seems to tie in quite a bit with like episodes like of Mud's Women from the from the original series, right? It's the de-aging process, and for some reason, and we find out why, by midway point through, Jameson is de-aging, and he's no longer wheelchair bound, and he's getting younger and younger and younger, and you know by the end he's looking um, basically looking like he's fresh out of the academy, right? Why is this mission so important to you? Why did you risk your life to lead it personally? I want to save lives, Captain. But, uh, so yeah, we get to see the reverse aging process as he travels to this world. You want me to help you up? Um, once, upon, once there, there is some battles. There's one, like, quick, quick like, uh, uh, search and rescue mission, but that's aborted fairly quickly. Abort! Abort! And it becomes a tense standoff at the end between the world leader and Jameson. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you the ending, just in case you haven't seen this, but uh, the ending may be a little bit surprising uh, for a Star Trek thing. But, you know, it's nothing too outlandish. But anyway, that's really the gist of it. The gist of it is, is Jameson trying to make up for a past mistake of his and to do so, he takes a risk, a big risk, and that's the de-aging process, which is gotten from an alien world. Uh, but he takes the unrecommended dose, basically a double dose, and he takes it 
really quickly. He's supposed to be over a period of years, two years, I think he says in this. And he just takes basically all at once because this mission pops up, right? So the whole driving thing behind this mission is his guilt for supplying the planet with Federation weapons. And this is where it gets into um, maybe the painting of the Federation is not always in a great light, even though it was kind of done by an individual. But anyway, let's go ahead and get into the pros and cons now and maybe we can talk about that just a little bit more. So let's talk about some pros first. Uh, as mentioned, the story is actually has some more, much more adult themes. There's there's hostages taken here. Threats of violent execution and torture are actually <laughs> expressly stated. Um, and the theme we are given here is this is a slight spoiler. So if you actually want to watch this episode, um, which I do recommend, of course, as all of them, you might want to stop now, come back to the video, or even better yet, close the video and come back to it later and give me another click. But I digress. Um, it's it's kind of a nice theme because what happens is Jameson armed the one side, Carnass's side. There are, I guess, two big factions on this planet back then. They were warring, but they didn't have really like advanced weaponry like the Federation does, right? So originally, hostages were taken uh, 45 years ago, and in order to get them released, uh, Jameson actually gave them weaponry. Now, whether this was at the express command of Starfleet, or he took it upon himself to do it, which seems kind of unlikely, but I think he does take credit for it solely. It's hard to say. In any case, he armed Karnas's side, right? Now that, that would have given him a decisive advantage over the other side. So what happens is, in him trying to even things out, he actually gave the same amount of weapons to the other faction as well. And what should have been a stalemate situation just plunged the planet into 45 years of civil war. Millions have died. Uh, at the hands of these weapons. So, that is the gist, the whole gestalt behind the Admiral's guilt, right? And it's kind of what kept him going throughout this mission and caused him to take the chances that he took. So I kind of like it. That's, a, that's an adult theme that you don't really see in Star Trek too much. It's a much darker thread and, like I said, almost every Starfleet captain, if they're not shown to be completely bonkers, is supposedly this paragon of virtue and it's like well, he might have been commander then, but where the face was, all the leadership in, in Starfleet seems to be almost paragons of virtue. And he didn't. He made an executive decision, whether, like I said, either on orders from a pie or on his own, to unleash implements of destruction on this planet. So it's, a, it's an interesting theme, and there's kind of a slight redemption arc here, but it's cool to see him basically take responsibility for his actions, if not in official capacity, at least in a personal one. So that's kind of cool. And I do like the idea of, you know, him kind of ODing on this de-aging drug to get himself in enough shape so he can actually negotiate these hostages or rescue them, which is what he winds up attempting to do later on. You flatter me. In a uh, kind of, a, like I said, a search and rescue operation. So, another cool theme right there. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, normally he probably taken this stuff gradually because, and he says it in the show, he's tired of being an invalid and being a burden on his wife. A wife who is basically uh, an old woman now, right? And he's getting younger and younger, so there's that dynamic. Um, it's not like he's chasing uh, young yeoman around the, the halls or anything. I hope you're heading for the bedroom. <laughs> But it's like, um, so it's, it's just, it's an interesting dynamic and something to ponder. It's like, you know, do they stay together? It's got a very Highlander feel. Remember how <laughs> Connor stayed with, uh, oh, what was her name? Oh, no. Heather? Heather. Uh, how he stayed with Heather the whole time, even though she was growing older and he stayed exactly the same age, you know. And it's very similar to actually toward the end, too. But I, like I said, I don't want to spoil it for you. So, uh, not that he cuts off anybody's head, not that kind of similar, but <laughs> similar arc is that one. Um, so that's kind of cool, and those two themes are actually kind of cool and good, right? And enough to, I think, raise this episode out of standard mediocrity. So let's, at least of season one, let's get into the cons. This, this episode is not without flaws. Um, for all the aforementioned things I said, this doesn't feel much like a Star Trek episode, other than tie-ins with the original series and some alien drugs, whatever, that can de-age you. This is basically... A transportation quest to the planet and, uh, and an insurrection storyline and it just 
there's no sci-fi elements here that you come to expect. You know, Star Trek can get away with that. But once again, this is season one, and this is something I think would fit in much more, especially when things got more serious in the later seasons, you know, in, in seasons three through seven, you know. So maybe this episode was a little early for it. Um, I don't know, but whatever the case was, sometimes it just doesn't feel like a Star Trek episode. And yes, you got plenty of Picard and plenty of Riker, but he has this great scene here where <laughs> the Admiral... And so anyway, the scene where the Admiral gets up on the bridge and walks out of his chair and Riker gets up, pivots, and stares directly at the, uh, at the viewer to let them know that something unexpected has happened. But uh, be that as it may, for the uh, season one Riker turn and stare, uh, it's, I said, it's a lot of it just doesn't feel like a Star Trek episode. And like I said, it, it, I think this would have been better served as a later season episode. They definitely could have dialed in on the drama a little bit more as they got better in the roles. But hey, it is what it is. And uh, you can't hold everything against it because it's in season one, right? Um, you know, most of the acting is all right. Jameson's guy is decent, uh, trying to play an 85-year-old disease-ridden man. Doesn't do too bad a job, right? Of course, Captain, you command the ship, but the mission is mine. I trust you are in full agreement. Um, not overly demonstrative, but he's an admiral, right? It's, even as he gets younger, he's still going to have the, the mind of the 85-year-old admiral, right? So he's a seasoned... Uh, and hopefully disciplined man, so so yeah, he's not overly demonstrative, and he's not given to wild gesticulations. Sometimes he gets a little silly, but whatever. For the most part, he's serious, and that's how you expect him to be played. The makeup effects receive a lot of criticism, and you know, you know, they don't have a ton of budget. I mean, it's high budget show, but yeah, they could look better. You know, the age makeup is not great, and they probably could have just swapped out actors, to be honest with you, with similar builds, you know. They didn't have to keep the build that similar as long as they're kind of slender, right? Um, but they didn't. They aged uh, Jameson up a lot, and it's obviously prosthetics and a lot of stuff and overly exaggerated motions, but I don't think his body work itself is that bad. Just that, yeah, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous looking, but, I mean, I give them credit... They tried something hard and they just pushed it through. It doesn't bother you too much, you know, unless you're just an edge lord looking for something to get mad at. It's 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 excusable. You're stronger today. I'm fine. I feel like a kid again. But it's not great. Um, and you don't really see much of the planet uh, that they go to, like one underground room basically they walk in and out of a couple times and then you see like the the throne room or whatever of the leader so and, and they're like you know they don't look, they're just humans they're completely normal humans right so once again star trek especially season one all they have is humans throughout the entire galaxy but rather than the occasional klingon but um yeah so uh, no other real glaring cons jameson's wife's a little bit Corny and goofy, kind of expect him, expect her to go walking into <laughs> the Believe It a Beaver episode, that kind of thing, and not because of her age, it's just because of the dialogue she's given and some stuff to work with. So there's a little bit of pseudoscience talk. It's not that interesting. And once again, Deanna is in the talks with the Admiral, like in the ready room with the Captain. Just why is she in there? I mean, she's always on the bridge anyway, <laughs> which. I've never cared for, but whatever. But she's in there at, like, one of the very initial briefings, in a high-level briefing about the hostage situation. Her services were not required. And then she's, like, questioning the Admiral and all that. It's like, who are you? Your ship's counselor. Get back to your office and counsel somebody. I can feel your anger. It gives you focus. Makes you stronger. Instead of, like, <laughs> interrogating the Admiral. But anyway, whatever the case may be. It is what it is. So let's go ahead and give this uh, a rating. I'm going to go ahead and say this is a fair episode. It doesn't suck. For season one, that makes it pretty stellar. But this is not like a great one. This is not one you're going to like revisit a lot. But it's not completely horrible. It's a little bit corny in spots. It's a little bit ham-handed. And, uh, you know, as far as revenge plots go and, and redemption arcs, it's pretty shallow. But, I mean, it's it's got some interesting ideas behind it. And like I said, I love... 
that the Federation is not painted as a perfect entity in this episode, and it too often is um, for its own good in all the series. Uh, they deviated from that quite a bit in DS9, which was a welcome, welcome addition, but at this point, uh, the series was basically Federation always good, other guys always bad, so I can dig it. I can dig the more mature and violent themes and uh, the taking responsibility for one's actions is kind of a nice, it's a nice thing. And it's got some <laughs> nods to the original series with the de-aging. So it's okay uh, and verging on a little better than average I'd say for season one. So hey, we were due for one of those, right? So anyway, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. Uh, I've talked long enough. so. Check it out if you like. It's it's not a horrible waste of 27 minutes. So uh, enjoy this uh, great prosthetic work. So anyway, thanks again for watching. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, stay tuned for more Star Trek review content coming up in the near future. And not to mention if I ever get back to it, my music review content. And I still have to do my Land of the Dead review, which should be coming up this week sometime. So as everyone knows, if I can review it, I will do it. So once again, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is Gino. Just a little bit worried about the next episode in the series. Out. I hope you're heading for the bedroom. You will. Joy and happiness. It certainly is.